is that uh, the use Okay, sorry. One of the things is because drugs, as we know them, um, are an expensive affair. Um, they are responsible for many deaths. Um, and people of all ages suffer the harmful consequences of drug abuse and addiction, beginning with the teens to the adults to the parents and even to the unborn babies, as we will see. So drugs affect all aspects of our lives, both medical, social, economic, and they even affect our society and our politics because uh, they are a huge part of the criminal justice system of our societies. So even as we are in the church, this is an important subject that affects all of us. So uh, what is drug addiction? Um, this is an important question to answer. Because if you do not know what you're dealing with, then you cannot be able to deal with it. You can't be able to address it and treat it. Um, so there are some who would think that uh, drug addiction um, is, uh, is witchcraft um, or it is another thing. But what is drug addiction? This is what drug addiction is. It is a chronic, meaning it is a condition that rusts and comes after a long term use of a drug. So one, it is a chronic, and it is also a relapsing disorder, meaning that it comes and goes, it comes and goes. And it is characterized by compulsive drug seeking and use despite adverse consequences. So uh, that is a definition that I think we all uh, probably are familiar with. But beyond that, and I think that is the essence of my talk this evening, I want us to understand that a brain a drug addiction is a brain disorder. It is a disease, right? You have a heart disease or you have other diseases. It is a brain disorder. It is a disorder that affects your brain. And it is a disorder because it involves functional changes to brain circuits that are involved in reward, stress, and also self-control. And those changes that occur in your brain of an addict, these changes will last long. Even after the person has stopped taking the drugs, those changes remain. And addiction is a lot like other diseases, such as heart disease. Um, in that it disrupts your normal healthy functioning of an organ in the body, in this particular case, the brain. And they both have, like other diseases, it has serious and harmful effects. And good news, it is preventable, it is treatable, probably not curable, but it is treatable. But if left untreated, it can last a lifetime and it may lead to death. So here, we are not just dealing with a moral issue. So a drug addict is not somebody with a moral problem. A drug addict is someone with a disease in the brain. That is a, is a take home message. So if you choose to address drug addiction just morally, then you miss the point. Um, and just to emphasize and to show you um, that uh, indeed drug addiction is a disease. If you see where my cursor is, um, let me use my pointer. I use a pen. You can see uh, where my cursor is. This is a PET scan of a brain, um, a normal brain. And this part of the brain, we call it the striatum. And these red areas uh, indicate areas of the brain with normal dopamine secretion. After this person had stopped using cocaine for one month, see what happens. Uh, these areas which have um, uh, dopamine, this is a normal brain. See, what happens is that the, 
there's a lot of change in terms of what is uh, this part of the brain we call the striatum. Uh, four months after this person has stopped using cocaine, there is some bit of restoration of some of this dopamine. So this tells you that uh, a drug addict actually has a physical and demonstrable changes in their brain. Uh, and these changes cause a disease that we call addiction or substance use disorder. The question also we want to ask and people always ask is why do people take drugs? People take drugs to feel good. Uh, they just want to feel good. Others um, are feeling good already, but they want to feel better. Others have set high goals for themselves and they want to achieve better things. So maybe they get into caffeine uh, addiction or other forms of addiction, so they want to do better. And that is because of curiosity and social pressure. These are the main reasons why people actually take drugs. But then the main question is, if taking drugs makes people feel good or better, what's the problem with drug abuse? When you first use a drug, or when somebody first uses a drug, they tend to perceive the positive effects of the drug. In this particular case, even take a small, uh, something that we probably consider as subtle as caffeine in the tea or in, in coffee. Someone is just perceiving the positive effects of that, that I want to be awake uh, for longer in the night so that I can achieve higher grades. So you're looking at the positive effects. And when you're doing that, you believe in yourself that you can actually control the use of that drug. But the question is, what's the problem? But drugs can quickly take over a person's life. And that's the problem with drug abuse, that they quickly take over your knife. It's like you're driving a car and someone just takes over the driver's seat and they just drive you wherever they want. So over time, if drug use continues, other pressurable activities become less pressurable and the person has to take the drug just to feel normal. In other words, you lose control over your life. That's what a drug will do. The other question we want to ask ourselves is this. This is now the science of addiction. Um, once you understand this, then you go to address many of the drug issues. Do people choose to keep using drugs? The key word there is keep using drugs. Um, the first time you choose to use a drug, that usually is a voluntary decision that you have made and you have chosen it. It is a moral decision. But with continued use, a person's ability to exert self-control becomes seriously impaired. And this impairment in self-control is the hallmark of addiction. So you can actually say drug addiction is you lose self-control completely. And in fact, uh, brain imaging studies of people with addiction have shown some physical changes in areas of the brain that are critical in judgment, decision-making, learning and memory, and also behavioral control. Uh, these changes explain the compulsive nature of addiction. So the answer is, these people actually don't choose to keep using the drugs. The drugs choose them for themselves because they have lost control. The other question people ask is, why do some people become addicted to drugs while others do not? Uh, because um, it is not all people who get addicted to drugs. And as with other diseases and disorders, as you remember we said that drug addiction is a disease, it's a disorder of the brain. So as with other diseases, the likelihood of developing an addiction will differ from one person to another. Um, so at Yeno, may not develop a drug addiction or alcohol addiction after taking five bottles of beer. But then we have a Kamau or somebody from China who will not even tolerate even a bottle of beer. People differ. So we don't have a single factor that determines whether a person will become addicted to drugs or not. However, we have things we call risk factors. And the more the risk factors a person has, the greater the chance that taking drugs will lead to drug use and addiction. So we have risk factors. On the other hand, 
we have protective factors. These ones reduce a person's risk. So the risk and the protective factors determine whether you, you get an addiction or not. And this may be either environmental or biologic. These are very important things because when you are trying to address drug addiction, these are the things you look at. The chart that you can see there shows you risk factors. So if you have this, then uh, the more you have, the more the likelihood of developing an addiction. If you have this, the rest of the chance of developing an addiction. So for instance, um, if you have an uh, aggressive behavior in childhood, that is uh, a very big risk factor. If there is lack of parental supervision, if you have low peer refusal skills, in other words, you're too gullible, anything is a yes. If you experiment with drugs, if you are in school as a young person and there's availability of drugs, and also community poverty has also been shown to do that. On the other hand, so these ones will increase your risk of drug addiction. On the other hand, if there's self-efficacy, someone who believes in self-control, um, if there is good parenting, positive relationships, extracurricular activities, school and drug policy, neighborhood resources, amongst others. So the protective factors, the more you have, the lower the risk you have of developing an addiction. So these generally are environmental factors, but then we have many other things that come into play. In this chart, we have biology, or what you call the gen genes. There are people who are genetically predisposed to developing an addiction much more than others. For instance, uh, if you consider something like alcohol uh, addiction, people who come from Japan and South Korea, or let me say about 40% of the population are not even able to metabolize alcohol. They can't tolerate it. So, which means it's they can't even take it because the, because they have some genetic defects that make them not be able to process alcohol as it's supposed to be. So, those are genetic uh, uh, issues that uh, uh, predispose them or protect them from getting an addiction. Male gender also predisposes more to addiction. Uh, having mental disorders. So, those that is biology and the genes. This come into play also with the environment. If you are coming from a chaotic home and abuse, parental use and attitudes, peer influences, and raw academic achievement. So these are the risk factors, both biologic and also environmental. So that is one of the things that really is very important. And then of course, there are also the factors that have to do with the drug itself. The root of administration of a drug. There are some drugs which are smoked. Generally, if, you, if a drug is smoked or it is injected, the risk of addiction is much higher than probably a drug which is taken uh, through the mouth. The effect of the drug, early use of the drug, the availability of the drug, and of course the cost. This one also has an effect on even how much of the drug you use. And then of course the brain mechanisms themselves. So all these factors play a factor in bringing you into an addiction or into altering your brain so that eventually now you have a disorder we call addiction. Uh, it's what to notice is that children's earliest interaction within the family are crucial to their healthy development and the risk of drug use. Uh, that's an important point to, to, to consider. More about the biologic factors. Um, science, remember we're talking about the science of addiction now. A scientist estimate that about 40 to 60 percent of the risk of addiction is due to the genetic makeup of somebody or a person's gene. The stage of development, the highest risk of addiction is in the teens and in persons with mental disorders. So the highest risk of addiction is not even in an adult, it's in an adolescent. Gender, the male gender, I talked about ethnicity also. And then, of course, we have environmental factors at home and the family and also at school. What other factors increase the risk of addiction? This one is an important thing to consider. The early use of a drug. And although taking drugs at an early age can lead to addiction, research shows that the earlier people begin to use drugs, the more likely they are to develop serious problems. And of course, how a drug is taken, I talked about smoking or injecting the drug into, into the veins. This image 
uh, and this slide is important um, because it shows you um, this is the brain viewed from the side and this is the brain viewed from the top. This is beginning from five years of age to when a child or someone is 20 years of age. Um, the brain continues to develop long after you are born. And as you can see, what influences which part of the brain will grow more or which part of the brain will grow more is what you are exposed to in your environment. So uh, we say that um, the brain is like the artist who is drawing a picture. So if the artist is mediocre and is drawing and he's painting wrongly, then what is painted in your brain also becomes known. Take note of this part of the brain, which we call the prefrontal cortex. It is involved in making sound decisions, keeping emotions, and also helping you with self-control. The brain will continue to develop into adulthood and undergoes very, very dramatic changes during adolescence. Take note of this word, adolescence. And one of the brain areas which is still maturing during adolescence is your prefrontal cortex. And this is the part that allows you to make, to assess a situation, to make sound decisions, and to keep emotions and desires under control. And the fact that this critical part of a teen's brain is still work in progress, it puts them at increased risk for trying drugs or continuing to take them. This also means if this part of the brain is affected or damaged so that this person be develops an, ad an addict's brain where than adolescence, it means you have altered that part of the neuropsychiatry very significantly and probably also for life in that child. So introducing drugs during this period of development may cause brain changes that have profound and wrong lasting consequences. And this brings us to another question. The best and the most critical time for preventing drug addiction is during adolescence because of what I have just explained. And this we have said because our use of drug will increase your chances of you becoming addicted. And then again, remember that the risk of drug use increases greatly during times of transition. Um, and even for a teen, this is really a time of great transition. An adolescent at this time also takes a lot of risks. So this is really a normal part of their development, but then they tell us to risk and also to take uh, experiments with drugs. And when they do that and they get hooked to them, then that part of the brain uh, just becomes disorganized. And then, of course, well, the brain is still developing. So you can influence positive behavior or negative behavior at this very particular time. The other question you need to ask yourself, and uh, some people ask, um, and here is a nice book that you can read. It's called Principles of Substance Abuse Prevention for Early Childhood, because this is generally when you can prevent these addictions from coming. Can research-based programs prevent drug addiction in the youth? And the answer is yes. A scientific research has shown that uh, these programs which are designed and based on current uh, scientific evidence have shown some positive results. Um, and they are based on a range of programs that positively alter. Remember, we had the, the, the protective factors and the risk factors. So these programs tend to focus on improving the protective factors for reducing the risk factors. And how do they work? So uh, they boost your protective factors and also eliminate risk factors for drug use. So we not just have programs for treating, there are also programs that are meant to prevent this. Um, uh, and you, there can be universal programs. These ones can be addressed to children of all kind. You could also have selective programs for groups of children who have a specific factor that needs to be addressed, or even for the youth, you can have indicated programs. Um, so uh, based on that science, you can understand why uh, these preventive programs can work and why intervening uh, for prevention during the adolescent or during the teen years is the most effective strategy. 
So um, we say that addiction is a disorder of the brain. Um, so let me just talk briefly about how the brain works. The brain really is who you are. And the brain is a circuitry of many, many circuits. Some people say it's like a microcomputer. If you can see where my cursor is, this is many, many nerve cells. This is a this is a nerve cell, and there are millions of them. And a nerve cell will conduct or transmit information from one point of the brain to another. That is what makes up the brain. And it is who you are. And this is where addiction is. This is a disease of the mind of the brain. As you can see in this picture, as I mentioned, the brain is made up of many parts with interconnected circuits. There are so many circuits that are interconnected. And these circuits work together as a team. And we have what is called a neuron, which is shown here. Um, and if this neuron wants to send a message, and there are thousands of messages which are transmitted in your brain at any one millisecond, this neuron will release a chemical substance called a neurotransmitter into this gap that is a gap between one neuron and another. We call it the synapse right here. Um, and then once this neurotransmitter crosses this synapse and it attaches to some receptors on this other nerve, um, then it is able to transmit information, uh, uh, information there. But how do drugs work in the brain? Drugs generally work by interfering with the way the neurons send receive and also process these signals that I've just mentioned. For instance, if you have marijuana and heroin, they work by activating the neurons uh, because their chemical structure will mimic that of the natural transmitter in the body. And so this allows the drugs to attach onto and activate those neurons. However, they do not activate the neurons or these nerve cells in the brain the same way the natural neurotransmitters will do they end up sending an abnormal message through the network. And some other drugs like uh, cocaine um, act here and they enhance the release of an abnormally large amount of neurotransmitters. Um, so they disrupt this neurotransmission in the brain. And because of this, they alter the circuitry of the brain permanently. So which parts of the brain are affected by drug use? The biggest part that is affected by it is what you call the basal ganglia. This, these are deep parts in the brain. This is the part that deals with motivation, um, including the pressurable effects of healthy activities, for instance, eating, socializing, or even sexual activity. And they help you in forming habits and routines. So the moment you take a drug, you are affecting the very core of your brain, the very core of who you really are. So this part we call the basal ganglia forms a very key component of what you call the reward circuit in the brain. When you take drugs, drugs generally overactivate this circuit here in the basal ganglia. And they produce what you call now the euphoria or the drug high. With repeated exposure, this circuit adapts to the presence of the drug and it diminishes its sensitivity to the normal things that make you feel pressure. And it eliminates them. That's what the drug does. It eliminates anything else other than itself. So you are only able to stimulate pressure in the basal ganglion just with the drug itself alone. The other part is what we call the extended amygdala here. This one now plays a role in stressful feelings like anxiety, irritability, and unease. And it is responsible for the withdrawal that you get. Withdrawal, these are feelings of anxiety and stress after the drug has gone raw in your system. And so this part here gets affected and it motivates the person to, to seek the drug again. So this part becomes increasingly sensitive with increased drug use. And over time, uh, for someone who has an addiction, um, uh, 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 the, this circuit becomes extremely activated. And then, of course, the other part is the prefrontal cortex. This is the part that gives you the ability to think, to plan, to solve problems, to make decisions, and most importantly, to actually exercise self-control over your emphasis. This is the last part of the brain to mature here.
And as I said, even during adolescence, up to the age of around 20 something, this part is still maturing. And because of that, it makes the teens and adolescents most vulnerable because they're not able to make clear decisions. And then again, if they become addicted, then this part also becomes distorted. But then again, it's an advantage because you can prevent, you can enhance formation of good habits through this part. Um, so shifting balance between this circuit and the circuits of the basal ganglion makes a person with substance abuse disorder seek drugs compulsively with reduced impulse control. Um, there are other parts of the brain which can get affected, like the brainstem, um, uh, which are affected by drugs like opioids, marijuana. So uh, you can take a drug and die because that's where your critical parts of the brain are. Uh, so besides this, you can also affect uh, the brainstem where you have critical parts of 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 of, of, uh, of knife uh, are centered. So how do drugs produce pressure? We mentioned about euphoria. Um, this is generally poorly understood, but it involves chemical signaling compounds, uh, including some of the natural opioids which we call endorphins and also other neurotransmitters in the basal ganglia, which called the reward circuit. However, when you take drugs. These drugs can cause surges in these neurotransmitters <clears throat> in much greater quantity than the smaller bursts that are naturally produced in association with healthy rewards like eating, hearing, or playing music or other social interactions. For instance, if today you go and you have dinner, that is going to, to make you feel good and feel nice. So your basal ganglia will produce some endorphins and also some other neurotransmitters like dopamine. So that will be in, in just some small surges that will make you feel good. However, when you take a drug, you have a flood of those feel-good hormones. They are produced in large quantities. And that is responsible for the euphoria that you have when you take a drug. There's a very important one called dopamine that reinforces drug use. So when you have that feeling of pressure, that is how your brain is wired to identify and reinforce some beneficial behaviors, such as eating, socializing, or even sexual activity, or any other activity which is beneficial for your body or for your life. So when the body reads that, and there is that feeling of pressure, the, body, the brain is able to record and know, ah, that's a good thing. So I want to do it over and over again. Um, and so, the neurotransmitter, which we call dopamine, is very, very central in recognizing this activity. So whenever this reward circuit in the basal ganglia is activated by a healthy, pressurable experience, you have a burst of dopamine signals that tell the brain that something is how important is happening that needs to be remembered. So this circuitry, which we call a habit, is formed because there is a memory that is being cemented in your brain using dopamine. So this dopamine signal causes changes in your neural circuits that make it easier for you to repeat this activity again and again without thinking about it, leading to the formation of a habit. That is how dopamine works. And you can see in this, uh, in this, uh, in this image that I've put for you here, this is how a habit is actually formed. So when you have a drug, these drugs produce an intense euphoria, and they also produce much larger surges of dopamine. And when they do that, they reinforce the, con the connection between consuming a drug and the pressure. And they eliminate any other cue or any other natural uh, thing that is linked to that. However, you may have some external cues which are linked to that experience. For instance, someone maybe who is, abu who is abusing alcohol, they may have an external cue. Maybe when it gets to Friday and maybe uh, the brain tells them it is Friday or it is the evening, the sun is setting and they walk past a certain joint, that becomes an external cue. So when the brain gets that cue, then immediately they just have to go and do something about it. So when you have those large surges of dopamine, they teach the brain to seek drugs at the expense of other healthier goals and activities. And it is good to remember that uh, those cues that form a part of uh, your daily routine and the daily routine of an addict, they become linked with this circuitry which has been changed and they trigger uncontrollable cravings whenever a person is exposed to these cues. 
even if the drug itself is not available. So in other words, you developed a RAND reflex. A reflex is something that happens even without you thinking. And this reflex can last a long, long time, even in a person who hasn't used the drugs for many, many years. For instance, you may have abstained from cigarette smoking for up to 10 years, but then you may just be exposed to that cue after those 10 years, and you may find yourself going back to that habit of smoking alcohol again, or smoking a cigarette again. So uh, because of that change in the brain, and I said it lasts a long time, even after you have used the drugs. So somebody may ask, why are drugs more addictive than natural rewards? So, and maybe someone may be asking, uh, or sometimes I used to ask people who have addiction, why, why is it that you, you just can't stop doing this thing? And the answer is this, this person is sick in the mind. For the brain, the difference between normal rewards and drug rewards, you can only compare them to someone who is whispering into your ear and to someone who is shouting into a, into a microphone. So the sound that you will hear is the sound of the microphone. So this microphone is like the drug. And the whispering in your ear is the natural healthy habits. And so just like you'd naturally do, you just shut down whatever is new and listen to whatever is, 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 is down. Um, and so because of that, the person's ability to experience pressure from naturally rewarding activities is reduced. This is an image that just shows you what happens. Um, and that when you take a drug, you have a very high surge of dopamine and this creates the addiction. Do you have any other consequences of drug addiction? Yes, there are many other things that happen other than in your brain. Um, people with drug addiction are at an extensively high risk of heart disease, lungs, uh, uh, pneumonias, and other things in the lungs, stroke, many cancers, mental health conditions. Um, and many, many other things, including HIV AIDS. As you can see here, um, newborn, for instance, if you have a mother who has a drug addiction, once these children are born, they suffer from what is called neonatal abstinence syndrome, because that baby, when they are born, they're already, they're already exposed to the drugs, they are used to the highs. Uh, and when they are born, they'll develop other things like tremors. They may have problems sleeping and feeding and even convulsions and even other problems later in life. Um, as you can see here, drugs have far reaching consequences uh, as can be seen here. Um, if you have any questions about this, we'll, encamp we'll, we'll encourage it later. So um, can addiction be treated successfully? The answer is yes, it is a treatable disorder. Can addiction be cured? The answer is no. You have to be careful what you put your brain through. Although this can be cured and managed, I mean, it can be managed and treated. Cure means returning the brain circuitry to what it was before you were introduced to the drugs. Unfortunately, this is a very, very difficult thing to achieve, but it can be managed can be treated. So cure means taking you back to the way God created you when you were born. That unfortunately is not possible. So once you have had an addiction, it means you remain at risk of falling back into that addiction cycle again. Um, and like other chronic, such as heart disease or even an asthma, treatment for drug addiction usually isn't a cure, but addiction can be managed successfully. You can form new circuits that will form new habits that will overcome the old circuits that you already have in your brain. And the aim of this treatment is to enable you to counteract the addiction's disruptive effects on the brain and to regain control of your life because the drug takes control of your life. Look at these PET scan images. This is a healthy person. Who was using a, a methamphetamine? This is a drug that sometimes is in the hospitals. 
um, it's abused sometimes by doctors and those who are in hospitals. So this is a healthy person. You can see we have good surges of dopamine and they are good and they are okay. One month after he abstained, the, you can see the dopamine receptors begin to come back and they are slow. And this is 14 months after he has abstained. He still hasn't gone back to what a normal healthy person would not like. And probably will we'll never come back to it. But maybe we'll develop other circuitry that will help him do that. So treatment and recovery is possible. Um, and it helps you regain control in life. But then if you can prevent this, then this would be the best thing because getting a complete cure you get back your circuitry to be as pure as it was before and that sometimes becomes an impossibility because some of the connections that you have formed will become permanent if someone is being treated and they develop a relapse does that mean that treatment has failed the answer is no if you develop a relapse it simply means that uh the person treating you will need to relook at what how they are treating you and probably modify or treat you in a similar manner. And the same way you have, uh, like maybe you have asthma and you have another attack that comes again. It's the same way someone who has a substance abuse disorder or drug addiction has that. One of the studies uh, was comparing people with hypertension and asthma and those with substance abuse disorders or drug addiction. And they found that um, the rates of relapses or recurrences of these illnesses are almost the same. However, you need to know that when you have a relapse, whereas it is a normal part of recovery for some of the drugs, it can be very dangerous or even deadly. For instance, if a person uses as much of the drug as they did before quitting, they can easily overdose because their bodies are no longer adapted to the previous levels of drug exposure. In other words, this person can actually take an extremely high dose of a drug and probably even die. So how do we treat uh, drug addiction? So for some of the things such as marijuana, heroin, or fentanyl, uh, we have some drugs that are the first line of treatment. And usually the drugs are not used alone. They are used in combination with some other form of treatment, such as behavioral therapy and all cancelling. And for other things such as alcohol addiction and nicotine, that is tobacco, we also have medication. Um, additionally, we also have other drugs that help you to detoxify from the drugs. We talk a lot about detoxification, especially even in our health talks in the church. However, detoxification is not the same as treatment, and it is not sufficient to help a person recover. If you just detoxify without subsequent treatment, this person will probably relapse. There are other drugs such as cannabis for which you do not have any medication to assist in the treatment. And so the treatment only consists of behavioral therapies. There are other forms of treatment that aid in you treating this drug. Uh, one of the ways is to treat the withdrawal symptoms that this person will have. Others help this person stay in treatment and others help in preventing relapse. And these are some of the drugs that we use. Uh, this would be useful for someone who is in the medical field to understand that uh, some of the drugs that we use for the various things. As you can see, for instance, alcohol is the most commonly abused drugs, but there are some drugs that are used for that. Behavioral therapies. This is what we always recommend for people, um, but it is just part of the treatment. So these ones help in drug addiction treatment in helping modifying attitudes and behaviors to, to a drug. Uh, and because of this, you find someone is able to handle stressful situations, tri uh, triggers that might cause that. And there are various forms of behavioral therapies. However, it's good to understand that these do not work in isolation. They must be combined with medical therapy where appropriate so that they can help you, including the famous uh, Alcoholic Anonymous uh, uh, program for alcohol addiction. Um, 
as I mentioned, uh, stopping the drug is just one part of a long and complex recovery process. You need to consider the whole person for you to be successful in managing this. And this one just shows you some of the things that you need to consider when you are treating someone with a drug addiction problem. If they have children, you need to consider about them. If it is a child, child care services, their family, um, where are they staying? Financial services. Maybe they have been involved in uh, in legal issues. They probably have HIV AIDS. They need to go back to school. They need the medical services. Their mental health may be affected, vocational services. So a lot of things need to come into place as you are designing a treatment program for these patients. So even as church members and as you try to think about this, this needs to be considered holistically as you go along. I want to finish by saying that for someone who has a drug addiction, this is a very sick person. This is someone with a disorder. The same way their heart has failed, it is the same way their brain has failed and they have lost control of their lives. But remind them that they can do all things through Christ who strengthens them. Also remind them that there is no temptation that has come upon them that is not common to man, but God is faithful. Also remind them that we have a great high priest who is able to empathize with our weakness. I love the word of God because it is powerful. Uh, together with the science that we know, when the word of God is combined with the science, useful science, then these persons can be saved and they can come out of their addiction. I wish to stop there. Uh, if we had more time, we would have talked about alcohol addiction, but I want Kate uh, to talk about bang and some other drugs uh, of addiction. We probably can take questions towards uh, the end. Uh, so I'll stop sharing my screen. Uh, if Betty, you can hear me so that Kate can share her screen. Thank you for your attention. Okay. If you have any questions, uh, maybe you could kindly give them at the end after Kate has given her talk. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this great, wonderful presentation. I'll ask that if you have any question, you can share it in the chat uh, as we carry on, cause uh, it's a wide topic. And uh, want to uh, thank Dr. Jefferson for trying to consolidate it for us to understand how important it is. As you welcome Dr. Kate. Um, Madam Kate, kindly feel welcome as you carry on with tobacco and marijuana. Thank you so much. Uh, you please give me a minute as I load my screen. Already, are you able to see my screen? Yes, you are able to see your screen. You can carry right. on, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Already, so I'm glad for the presentation that you have had on addiction. And I'm just going to carry on with just two drugs that you're going to consider today. It's because it's a wide topic. I wish you could do more. But these two will actually give us quite a lot of insight so that we are able to uh, complete now the learning cycle from the addictions to the actual drugs that, um, that are out here. So first, I'm going to talk about tobacco and it forms. Then we'll talk about what is actually in tobacco. And then we'll talk about the effects that it has on the body. And then eventually we'll talk about bang. And then we'll have a final slide on recovery, finding healing and how we do management uh, for, for this addiction. So let me start by saying, why do people smoke actually? 
sometimes you may ask, you know, I think alcohol can fill the stomach a little bit. But you can ask yourself, why do people actually smoke and what is it that is in smoking? So there are many reasons and there could be as many as the number of smokers. But one of the reasons is some people just smoke to ease communication. Suppose you're having a difficult time, you've lost your job or you've lost a family member. You are in a difficult season in life and it's hard to have some conversations. Some people can find some ease you know, some boldness when they smoke. For some, it's just to take a break from work. For others, it's to serve as a reward um, because of the stimulating effects of tobacco. Some may smoke because they say it helps them to manage their weights because they say smoking curbs their appetite. For some people, they may feel like they want to smoke just to ward off fatigue so they feel, you know, upbeat to suppress negative feelings such as stress or boredom. Continually, it kind of hijacks the brain. So it's sending up normal signals every time and in the brain, someone just, you know, the receptors for this dopamine, they just increase and increase and you really feel the urge to smoke and smoke much more so that you fill up. So those receptors are always saturated and that leads to the development of addiction. We're going to look at the various forms of tobacco. And tobacco is consumed in two ways. It can be consumed as um, by smoking but there are also forms of tobacco that actually are smokeless, and we're going to look at this. Let's start with the picture here. And at the far left, you'll be able to see a green field, and those uh, plants are the tobacco plants. You're able to see cigarettes, and cigarettes are supposedly safer. Uh, people who are smoking, they are safer because they have a filter, but unfortunately, the filter protects only the person who is smoking, but they do not protect those who are around the smokers. So many people are able to consume secondhand smoke because that filter is really for the person who is smoking. And what is it filtering? It is just filtering the tar that is from the smoke, but there's still a good amount of it that gets to the land. We have cigars there in the second image. They are very common in South American countries. And when I was going through this, I realized they're actually made in an interesting way because the tobacco leaves are dried for a period of a year. And then they are fermented for another three to five months. And then now they are rolled and packaged in these leaves and then they are branded and sold. And I was thinking something that has been dried for a year and then fermented for months. I can't imagine the level of damage that you get from just consuming one cigar. But they are really uh, treasured by those who smoke because they they give the feel of, you know, they're exotic, they, they look posh, but the effects are really, are really negative. There are others like BDs, which is like a mini cigar. There are others like the critics which are seen, I used more in Asian countries like Indonesia, that's where they so the tobacco is mixed with things like mint and cloves and cumin to give it a nice scent, but they're actually quite toxic. Now for the young people, nowadays there's also shisha and many people are actually deceived and they say it is a safer way of taking tobacco. And I'm going to take us through uh, this study there was a study that was done that was trying to see how much nicotine and tar are in various tobacco products. So there's doka, there's shisha, the ordinary cigarettes. And people normally think that shisha has a low, you know, tobacco content, it's safe. 
And I was surprised to see that you see in cigarettes, you get like 0. 0.5 to 19.5 milligrams um, per gram of nicotine. But in this newer, uh, newer tobacco products like Yokai, Shisha, you get up to 23 to 52 gram, uh, milligrams of you know nicotine per gram and i was so surprised this is quite high it is much higher than actually if you're smoking an ordinary cigarette there was another article that was done by the citizen it's a tanzanian uh, article and they were trying to compare someone who smokes an ordinary cigarette to someone who smokes shisha so I'll try uh, going through the two paragraphs together and you'll follow me. So an ordinary cigarette smoker generally will take about 8 to 12 puffs in one cigarette. Each puff contains maybe 40 to 75, let's say an average of 50 mils of smoke. If they're smoking one cigarette, they'll probably take five to seven minutes to smoke. So in total, this person will have taken about half a liter of smoke per cigarette. However, let's look at shisha. How long does an ordinary smoking session take for shisha? 20 to 80 minutes. So let me say an average of about 50 minutes, maybe an hour. And each person is taking 50 to 200 puffs and each of them has 600 mils of smoke. So a single session of shisha smoking is actually equivalent to consuming a hundred cigarettes or more. You can imagine the difference. If you had noticed the shisha pot I had shown it earlier, it has this black bottom part that is the pot, that is where the tobacco is and it is mixed with some herbal things. Unfortunately, the problem with shisha is, is particularly in our setting, it is rarely sold as just plain tobacco. Many times it will be laced with other drugs. It could be laced with heroin, could be laced with many other drugs, depending on the preference of the person. And then it is passed through water. But that smoke is still actually as toxic as if it was, you know, the, the, the tobacco was just being burnt directly. And then the person now puffs on it using this hose pipe. And then at the end here is where you put them out. And sometimes there's even sharing because usually shisha is taken in parties. It's a, I think the more the merrier. So people go sharing and you can even transmit oral infections from one person to another. So shisha is not actually a safer option. If anything, it is worse than someone who is taking just a plain cigarette. Let's look at the smokeless tobacco forms. One of them is the e-cigarette, and it's also considered to be an elite way of uh, using tobacco. The e-cigarette doesn't really have tobacco. It's just a nicotine delivery system. So there's a battery, and the battery is powering the delivery of nicotine. And then the black part is where someone puffs on it. So what they're puffing is more of a steam. But this steam, for it now to come out as a steam, then it is usually mixed with propylene glycol. There are also candy strips of nicotine. There are also chewable snaps. So it's put somewhere just almost the same way like mirror. So somewhere between the lip or the cheek and the teeth, that's where it's inserted. And someone sucks on it while spitting the tobacco juices. There are many forms, but these are the ones that are common. And people still assert that smokeless tobacco is safe. But it actually contains up to around 28 cancer-causing agents, 28 carcinogens, and there could be more really. This is just from a study that was quoted. And it really does increase the risk of developing cancer of the oral cavity. As you can see, it is put in the mouth, it's put in the cheek for very long periods, and someone continuously sucks, you know, whatever juices are coming out of that snuff. As well, it has nicotine, and we learned earlier that the nicotine is actually what leads to addiction. It's what interferes with the dopamine pathways in the brain. It's what leads to the receptors being increased in the brain and eventually leading to addiction. 
So what is the problem with tobacco really? What does it do to us and why is it a problem for someone who is smoking? Let me start by giving the example of China that is quoted to have approximately 350 million smokers. And in aggregate, China consumes a third of all the cigarettes that are smoked worldwide. It's such a high number. It's also a known fact that 90% of lung cancer in the world occurs in people who are smoking. And cancer by WHO standard, the not cancer, but tobacco is actually considered to be a class one carcinogen, meaning it is known to have a, a direct association with cancer causation. Cigarette smoking, what are the consequences? About 4 million deaths occurring in the world annually are directly related to tobacco. In terms of longevity, around 80% of non-smokers are alive at age 70, but it's only about 50% of smokers who survive to this age. What about secondhand tobacco smoke? Secondhand tobacco smoke is what you and I consume when we live or stay near someone who is actively smoking. So even if you're a secondhand smoker, you have a family member who is smoking in the house, you're in the car and someone else is smoking, and that happens recurrently. It has, it increases the risk of lung cancer by about 30%. I know many people may not realize, but smoking actually affects blood vessels, particularly the heart blood vessels, and they can cause thickening of those blood vessels so that now the lumen or the, the space where blood passes through is very tiny, and that can lead to heart attacks. In children, children of parents or guardians who smoke, especially in their vicinity, and they do it regularly, they tend to have increased risk for asthma, allergies, and respiratory illnesses. What about maternal smoking? Mama, a mother who is smoking, they are carrying a pregnancy, they have increased risk of abortion more than the normal population. They have an increased risk of delivering prematurely, and the babies tend to have growth restriction while they are inside the uterus. So they don't develop to achieve the optimal weight by the time they are being born. They also tend to have a low birth, birth weight. What are the chemicals that are seen in tobacco? What are some of them and what are their effects? I was surprised to really see that Tobacco actually has a wide range of chemicals, but the ones that have actually shown increased effect or the most effects are just what I will highlight now, but there are so many compounds. Some of them have not yet even been described, but I'll just describe the ones that are relevant to our discussion today. And one of them is the tar. So as we said, the cigarettes do have a filter, but most other tobacco compounds are consumed as they are without a filter. And even with a filter, there's still a good quantity of tar that gets deposited within the lungs. And this is actually known to cause cancer. So when you see carcinogenesis, it just means it's able to bring about cancer. When you think about smoke, smoke is full of polycyclic hydrocarbons. Those ones also cause carcinogenesis. The nicotine, is mainly responsible for causing addictions, but it does also promote uh, development of tumor. There are many other compounds, including carbon monoxide, which impairs oxygen transport and even worsens the burden on the heart because of the low oxygen states. We do have things like formaldehyde that just damage the lining, the mucus lining that uh, usually helps to move the mucus out of the way continuously within the body. These are some of the effects that you might see in someone who has had um, smoking for a long time. I just highlight the ones that are involved because those are the ones that have seen commonness. So the top one for sure is cancer of the lung, even though cancer of the oral cavity is also a very common finding. 
they also have recurrent infections and inflammation of their pathways in the in the in the <clears throat> in the lungs because the smoke directly is toxic you know to the mucus like irritation and because of that of that the body responds by producing a lot a lot a lot of inflammatory factors and that just causes a constant or chronic inflammatory state within the lungs sometimes the lungs may balloon out they can become barrel shaped and that's a disease we call emphysema they can they usually do have increased risk of cardiovascular illnesses and it is said that about 30 percent of the deaths that occur in the us for instance are directly attributable to uh, smoking because of its effects in the heart things like ulcers are also common but again, the important one there is the effects on the blood vessels, the systemic atherosclerosis, whereby it causes thickening of the blood vessels and narrowing of that lumen. For women, I'd like to emphasize that if you have HIV, for instance, and you smoke, your chances of getting cervical cancer are really, really elevated compared to the normal population. Let's talk about bang. Bang is also referred to as marijuana and it is consumed in various ways. And in recent times, I know that we have seen many countries trying to legalize the medicinal use of marijuana. So what is in bang that produces its effects? So bang is, 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 is from cannabis sativa. It's prepared differently. Some people eat the bud, some use the flowers, some use the leaves, the stem. Is consumed variably, but the main things that produce the effect are two compounds. One of them is called THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, and we have cannab cannabinodiol. So the THC and the CBD. The people who normally uh, argue for or against uh, uh, medical use of marijuana actually argue based on these two compounds. And this is what they say. So they say that THC is the negative or it is the one that is responsible for most of the psychoactive effects. Most of those things that you see like aggressiveness, red eyes, anxiety, paranoia, all those things, they are, they are caused by the THC part of the cannabis sativa plant. Then you have the CBD, and they say the CBD is what tends to produce the positive. Um, they say it is non-intoxicating. However, the truth is that even the CBD actually has psychoactive effects. It's able to alter the way the mind functions, even though it is not directly intoxicating. So they say this one is what helps in terms of maybe management of pain, uh, because they advocated for pain management for chronically ill patients. Uh, they also say it reduces nausea and vomiting. However, the truth is, as they're doing the studies right now, they're seeing that, well, for you to achieve then that medicinal dose, then you need a ratio of almost one to one of THC to CBD. And you wonder... So how do we get the benefits then? Because you are putting the good and the bad in equal measure. The effects on the brain are also quite extensive. Marijuana causes dopamine release. And so it's going to give you addiction and withdrawal when you don't take it. People get paranoia so they can have, you know, false perception. Someone is going to attack me. Someone is after me, after my life, they can have hallucinations, impaired judgment, even to the point of causing accident, memory problems, anxiety, depression, among other things. Now about the teens, it has been shown by several studies that when teens or when marijuana is used early in life, Teens are actually somewhere in the middle of children and adults and their brains are still developing. So they are very, very vulnerable. Those circuits in the brain are still forming. And it has been shown that teenagers who use marijuana early and regularly, they can have a drop in the IQ of up to eight points. 
in terms of the education, they tend to have lower grades. They are less likely to control in college later in life. Later in life, they have been shown to have a higher risk of having lower satisfaction with life. They will likely tend to earn a lower income because they have not been able to achieve a higher education and they've also not been able to secure their jobs. They're also more likely to be and remain unemployed. Let me come to the management of this and this is my last slide. When you have a family member or when it is you yourself or you have a friend who is struggling with addiction, it's important to realize This is a chronic illness. The same way it will require treatment over and over again. There's no one stroke that will clear all. It will need multiple attempts, both by the person who is addicted and by the person who is intervening. And so you should not get discouraged if someone has to make multiple attempts at quitting. And in the same breath, it means you might have to help this person severally, maybe take them to rehab now, they fall out, you take them again, they fall out. But the same way you would think of a chronic illness, that is the same way you should think of an addiction. Someone has lost control. The frontal lobe is damaged. The other pathways in the brain, they are damaged. And it will take a miracle of God for all those to be restored. And so there is likely to be times when they are relapses and that is why I have that second point that says everyone who is willing to make an attempt for as long as someone is willing to make an attempt they should be encouraged and they should be helped to find help I also found another study that says for someone who is able to quit smoking particularly for five continuous days they have a high chance of achieving complete and why is this so? So when someone has addiction to tobacco, there are many aspects of the addiction. So one aspect is they have addiction to the nicotine. Nicotine, the good news is that it has a very short half life within our bodies. Within three to five days, the body will have cleared all the nicotine uh, within it. And so if someone is able to bear the effects of withdrawing from nicotine for at least five days, which is the period within which you expect that the nicotine will be shed off, then they have a high chance that they will actually pull through and completely see. Some people normally say, you know, counseling, how much really would you achieve? It has actually been shown that both counseling and medication are useful and they have actually succeeded in treating some patients independently with either counseling alone or medication alone. But the best is when there's a combination of both pharmacologic interventions, so the patches, the sprays, things like those, the medication, plus counseling and family support. So when you're incorporating both behavioral therapy and the support of medication, then there are higher chances of achieving complete cessation. I'd like to finish by saying, even if the person who is addicted is unwilling to make an attempt at this time, there are still many interventions that can be done if you're able to link them with the right help. I just want to say that there's no one who is beyond the help of God. Even the worst of men have been able to make a turnaround and as we say, for as long as someone is willing or for as long as the person is still alive, we should always give them a chance. And sometimes giving them a chance might mean showing some tough love, including, including individuals to face consequences of their action because addictions are also fueled by enabling habits. So it can be habits it can be people who are enabling their addiction maybe the alcohol is just outside the door it's just outside the house and you can always fetch it anytime or the tobacco is just next door maybe that is what is causing the addiction maybe 
maybe it is your friends who are constantly pulling you to go and buy or it could be a family member who is enabling that behavior they are bailing you out every time you are caught you know you've borrowed money from this one and this one because of the addiction and they're always bailing you out even that is also an enabling behavior so we say as we started that we can do all things through christ who strengthens us there's nothing beyond the help of god but it also takes a lot of willpower by the person who has been addicted to say they are sick or being sick or being tired so they can be able to turn on a new day. Thank you so much. I've come to the end of my presentation. I think we'll hold it there, Betty. You can take it from there. If there are any comments or questions, we'll be glad to take them at this point. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jefferson and the Kate, Mr. and Mrs. I've just stepped in for Betty. This is Jane Nyakundi, and um, Betty had to leave for something. So thank you so much. It has been a very uh, good presentation, and I wish we had more time, but uh, we don't have the time. So I think I will allow some questions, just a few, one or two. We have one question on uh, on the chat. Uh, maybe you can see that. Uh, can you see the chat? Uh, there's a question there on the chat. I'm just uh, looking at it. Um, so I will give you a chance maybe to answer. There's a question from our sister Grace Lambati, and uh, it is uh, reading CBD oil and hemp products. I think she means are widely sold in the market as supplements and inflammatory products. Could these products lead to addiction after prolonged use? Any of you can uh, answer that. All right. Thanks, Grace, for your question. I see. Um, I, I I appreciate the question. Uh, CBD oil and hemp products are widely sold in the supermarkets as anti-inflammatory products. Could these products lead to addiction after prolonged use? So, as I said, there are two parts to the cannabis plant. There is the THC, which is implicated in most of the negative effects, and we have the CBD. The oil and the hemp products, I think they are mostly, they, they are usually used externally, but I know that there are communities that actually even cook, they incorporate them into their meals. <laughs> um, so as I said, even CBD, even though it is not intoxicating, it does have psychoactive properties within it. And so the effects of the effects of CBD, not really CBD, but the effects of cannabis are really more of accumulate. It's a dosage affair. How much of it and for how long are you using? And so I think even if uh, studies are still ongoing, I think your concern is valid. Although I would like to think that externally applied applied products may not have the same effect as you know, when CBD is ingested because there are people who ingest it. So I would like to think that the effects are likely minimal. But again, I would like to believe that there are other things that you could take in that will still give you even better anti-inflammatory effects. I would personally not advise. I know that Indian hemp is also good. I know many women use it for, for the hair. But because you never know how pure some of these substances are, sometimes it's just better to err on the side of caution and avoid or try and see whether you can get alternatives. That is my comment, but I keep looking on the scientific landscape to see what comes out. And again, even as you read, there's also, if you, if you read a, a few of Ellen White's books, she says, there is what people call science out there, but which is not true science. True science will really never contradict 
what seems to be, you know, what God will have us do. So I know there are many papers that are churned out every day and there are many who would want us to lean more towards, let us legalize, let us use this medicinally. But I think there is convincing evidence that I don't know if the benefits really outweigh the risk. So that will be my comment. I hope, Grace, I was able to answer you. Is there another question? Thanks. All right. I hope I didn't miss any other question. Feel free to ask or to make a comment um, so that you're able to learn together. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry, I've been talking while I'm um, unmuted. So is there any other question? I have been checking and I cannot see any hand raised. So uh, we can have a closing um, song from our daughter, Samantha. And if Samantha, you could do one stanza and a chorus, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the very informative session. I'll sing hymn number 532. Um, I'll do one stanza, the first stanza. Day by day and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my father's wise bestowment, have no cause for worry or for fear. He whose heart is kind beyond all measure gives unto each day what he deems best. Lovingly, it's part of pain and pleasure, mingling toil with peace and rest. Amen. Before we we can have a closing prayer, I have seen our pastor there. Um, I think I've seen our pastor soon too. And maybe I'll just uh, give him a minute um, to tell us anything I uh, want before we can pray. I, I just want to appreciate our speakers uh, in fact, um, what we have learned here is very, very important, and uh, it will assist us because uh, addiction is affecting many people, regardless of uh, either Christians or not Christians. So I just want to appreciate and say thank you so much, and we hope that one time again we'll have time to hear from them. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you so much. And at this time, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Kate if you could uh, finish with a closing prayer, please. Alrighty. Thank you, everyone. Let us pray. Almighty God, we praise you so much for the evening. we ought to live in this life and to also hold other people's hands next to us that we may run this race of life and run it victoriously. We pray, dear Lord, that you will continue to speak to us even after this time 
Help us, Lord, to know how to maneuver addictions, some that may be within us and some that may be in those part one from another, O oh Lord. We pray that your Holy Spirit shall minister unto us. And if there is someone struggling with an addiction, Lord, in our forum this evening, Lord, we pray that you may give us the grace to overcome because, Lord, you have promised us that we can do all things through Christ who gives us the strength. We pray, dear Lord, that we will bless each member who attended. Bless those who guided us this day. Bless our hosts, O oh Lord, and disperse us with your peace. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.